Hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas. I know I've talked to a few of you. Your, your today is going to be a rest mode, try to recovery uh, from, from all of the events, and, and that's good. Uh, a day of rest is good for all of us, and certainly uh, uh, each year as we prepare for that celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, uh, looking forward to the coming new year, which we know uh, this is our last Sunday morning service for the... Uh, for this year, uh, of course, I want to invite everyone to be back this evening. We will uh, conclude our Christmas series. But we oftentimes, when we do our Christmas sermons and in preparation for that, we look at the struggles and the hardships that Joseph and Mary uh, suffered, and we talk about the wise men and the shepherds, and, and even Herod comes into the conversation. But one thing that we rarely look at, as I was thinking about uh, what to bring this morning was the response that Mary had to all of the events going on around her. We don't oftentimes look at her. Uh, this morning, as Christmas comes to a close, this Christmas weekend, I want to look at Mary's response and see what we can learn from her example. In Isaiah 7, 14, she's prophesied about, uh, not named, but prophesied, it says, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's what we know about her in the prophecy, that she would be a virgin. And that came to be true. And as we look and study about her, we need to, to keep in mind and, and not to become detached from her experiences as well. So uh, you may not realize it, but, but Mary is only recorded as speaking. Her words are recorded four occasions in the Bible, in the New Testament, four times. And we're going to look at all four of those. And in those responses or the times that she speaks, I think we can get a great uh, lesson from uh, uh, what she and her faith has done. So the first one we're going to look at, obviously, with with it being Christmas, comes out of Luke chapter 1, if you want to turn over in your Bibles, uh, verses 34 and 38 is the, uh, what we will look at here, her actual responses. In Luke chapter 1, verse 34, after the uh, angel announces to her that she's going to, going to be with child, Mary says, Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And then after the angel explains that the Holy Ghost will overshadow her, Mary responds in verse 38, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So in that section of scripture, the announcement of the birth or the uh, of the miracle conception uh, of Jesus in his mother Mary's womb, she, she asked the question, how can this be? Well, any young woman today in the same situation would ask probably the same question. How is this possible? How would it be possible that I would become pregnant when I'm not married, when I have not known a man, as she says? And it's a normal human reaction to that. And we can see and learn a lot about Mary here because we, we in principle act the same when God leads us to do something doesn't, don't we God leads me or, or guides me to, to do something well Lord how in the world can I do this how is it possible for me I'm not equipped to do this I don't have the experience to do these kinds of things uh, I don't have the voice to sing I don't have the ability to do this how can I do this Lord in the same way that Mary is saying here, how can this be? How can this be? And But it's in that response also that she says in verse 38 that gives us the lesson. Maybe even a lesson that she went on to teach Jesus when she says, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. It makes me think about when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, Verse 26, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, 
but with God, all things are possible. And it's that spirit that Mary had in her heart once she was uh, told by the angel. And think what a, a marvelous event that would be to have an angel come down and speak to you. And probably be difficult to even utter any words from the miraculous event of that. But once she realized that God was in control of things, that God had led her to this point, what was her response? Be it unto me. Whatever you say, Lord, I will do. You have guided me to this point. I have faith in you. Your will be done. And that's what we see her reaction here. We oftentimes respond differently, don't we? We have a sack full of reasons that we won't uh, move forward, won't, leave, won't follow that leading. And I'm not going to go over that sack full of reasons. You each have your own. Some of you may have none. Some of you may have many. And that's what I want you to think about and reflect on through this week. What are your reasons that you would say when you would ask, how can this be, Lord, that you would say to yourself, it is impossible. But is it impossible with God or is it impossible with you? And that's what we need to reflect on. We need to think on these things. That has God, if God is bringing me to something, surely God will lead me to do and equip me to do what his will is. And in this example, Mary gives us is an excellent example of that. Because you could just imagine. Think about uh, what she would be thinking about at this time. All of the ramifications of that. Mary speaks again whenever she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And there in that household, a very similar situation happens with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. He had been praying for a son. We don't know how long, but apparently for some time. Because he and his wife Elizabeth were up in years beyond the age of bearing children, the scriptures tells us. And the angel came to him, just like he did Mary, and said to him, your prayers have been heard and are going to be answered through a son. Of course, that's me paraphrasing. And what did Zechariah do? He questioned it. He said, how can this be? Since we, she is beyond the, the age of bearing children. And the angel caused him to go uh, dumb, was not able to speak until the birth of his son, John the Baptist. In the same way that Mary asked, how can this be? Zechariah did that. So the next time, uh, and it's odd that he had been praying for a son, the angel says, your prayers have been answered, and he questions the answer. Do we do that? Do we pray sometimes? And we pray and we pray, and then we get an answer, and then we question the answer? I think we do. I think we're probably all guilty of that. And thank goodness the Lord doesn't strike us dumb like they did Zechariah. But maybe he should strike us in the mind and in the heart and remember that if God says that we are to do it, if we're led to do it, then we should follow faithfully because he will provide for us. Now, as I said, Mary was going to see uh, her cousin Elizabeth. We know that there's about six months age difference between John the Baptist and Jesus. And Mary came and we see this account in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 55. The most that Mary speaks in any time that she's quoted in the scriptures. And this is what we're going to look at this morning as well. The second part, her witness to Elizabeth. In verse 46, and Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm, and hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. 
and as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now some of your Bibles may have that caption as the Magnificat, where she exclaims and witnesses to Elizabeth about the goodness. Now in verse 40, Luke recorded that she came in and greeted uh, Elizabeth, but didn't record the greeting. But we know as a result of that greeting that the babe leapt in Elizabeth's wombs at the sound of her voice. John the Baptist, already knowing through the Holy Spirit what he was being sent to do, even in the womb, that, that he recognized the one that would come after him. He recognized the one that whose shoe he was not worthy to latch, even in the womb. And I think that's important for us to remember, as especially as we come upon this Sanctity of Life month. It is life, and it is life from God that is in those wombs. And that's what we need to continue to pray for in this nation, that the horror of abortion would be ended. Because could we imagine if it were available then? They may have counseled Mary. We never think about things like that. But here we see her witness to Elizabeth. And in the words, we see a woman who is committed to her relationship with service to God. My soul does magnify or lifts up God, lifts up my Lord. He has done many great wonders and things to, to his people who faithfully follow him. And look at what he has done for me. Look at how I will be blessed and the generations beyond will call me blessed because I am carrying his son. Now, of course, that's me paraphrasing. But that is the spirit of what she's saying. She's acknowledging God being great, all the mighty works that God had done and how he had chosen her, a lowly handmaid, to be in the service of him by carrying and raising his son. She realizes what a great responsibility it is and also what a great blessing it is that she will do this service for God. Do we look at our service to God in that way? Do we praise God when we have the opportunity to serve in a ministry somehow? Do we praise God when we have the opportunity to be Christ to someone outside of our church, in our communities? Do we praise and lift up his name because he has chosen me to do something for him in, his, in, in a ministry? We should. I think it's an excellent example that Mary leaves here for us. Even though it could be difficult, we know that it was going to be difficult for her. We know that she was going to have to try to explain to her mom and dad, let alone Joseph, but mom and dad and her friends and and could you imagine the priest, what she was going through her mind? Oh, this is an offense worthy of death according to the law. Those priests are going to kill me. But she still lifted up God in praise because he chose her to do this wonderful thing. And maybe we should too. She didn't let the what if, the what if affect her service to God, to affect the plan that God had for her. And I ask, how many times have you allowed what if to kill your service to God? To kill a ministry that maybe he had planned for you? To kill something, a, a, uh, an opportunity? What if? She didn't let it stop her. And it's a good example for us to follow as well. Now the next time that we hear Mary and her words speak, Jesus is about 12 years old. So some time has passed for the little family. We know that they have been to Egypt and then was brought back. And really we don't know much about anything about from the time that they came back from Egypt until now, that when he was about 12 years old, which would have been the time that, that Jesus as a young Jewish male would have been entering into the temple for service type of things uh, uh, age of 12, 13 years old. So that's why this was so important this particular year for Jesus. We'll see this rec recorded in Luke chapter 2, verse 48, the next time that she speaks. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke 2, verse 48. And Luke records and says, And when they saw him, of course this being Jesus, 
they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us this way? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. You had us worried to death, she is saying. That's how we'd say it today. You had us worried to death. So could you imagine now, life has happened for her. Twelve years of life has happened from, from the time that, that the angel came and announced that she was going to carry the, the, the Son of God to the time that she went to Elizabeth and lifted up her, her voice and, and magnified God because of the great and wonderful things uh, that he had done for her and done for all of the faithful and how he had brought up uh, the lowly and taken down the high. And You've worried us to death, she says to Jesus and if there's ever an example of someone who has been faithful for who, even if just for a moment, forgot what God had done for them, this is it. This is that example. What if we just studied the past two things, as I said? And Twelve years later now, she's worried about her son. She's worried about the son of God. Be a typical mother, I would imagine. She had because of life, maybe because of things, well, maybe because that they were there at the Passover and uh, all the things that could get caught up in those events for her family. Pack up all the stuff, keep the kids all together in the big crowd. Uh, Jesus, where is Jesus at? Have you seen Jesus? He was with you the last time I saw him. We're going to have to go back and find Jesus. We can imagine that scenario in our own minds. And that's the case. And they go back. And she sees Jesus, as Luke says. You had us worried to death. Why have you done this? Mom, I'm doing my father's work. Why are you worried? And in that moment, I would imagine she thinks, because the scripture says she held these things in her heart. She, I would imagine she was reminded when Christ, the 12-year-old boy, says, Mom, I'm doing my father's work. Why are you worried? How many times have we ourselves got caught up in so many things that life goes on around us and we forget about what's going on and forget about whose we are and what he's done for us and we need just for a moment for the Holy Spirit to say to us, Rob, I'm about my father's work. And then we can take that comfort back because oftentimes we sacrifice God's comfort, the Holy Spirit's comfort, by allowing the world to interject and cause us to have fear and panic and worry. And it's easy enough done. I'm not criticizing her, nor am I criticizing anyone that hears this message. I'm just wanting to make us aware of this is what happens to us. And sometimes we need that small, still voice inside of our hearts and inside of our ears to remind us that God still loves us and God is still working in our lives. And I think Mary gives us an excellent example of this. So I want to encourage you as well is to not forget whose we are, even though it's easy to do sometimes. Don't be distracted. Don't let the world distract you from the comfort of God's love. Now, the last time that we hear Mary speak or her words are recorded, some 18, 19 years later, and she's at a wedding. In uh, John chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, she speaks. John chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. And in verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. It was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. For some 30 odd years she had been with Jesus. She had raised Jesus. She had witnessed all of these things. All of him growing in stature and in knowledge and in wisdom, the scripture tells us. So he grew to be a young man, and then he grew to be a man. And his knowledge was such that he was able to teach in the temple at a very young age. And she witnessed all of these things, kind of from the outside looking in, but also being the mother of this young man at this point. Jesus, they need some wine. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. 
the final words that's recorded by her. What do we see here in this example? Who does she go to when someone needs something? Who is the request made to? Jesus, her son. But we also have that same ability to go to Jesus, our Savior, in the same way. But what is the, and I don't know that this is probably not the best advice that's given in the scriptures that if we all followed it, if the whole world followed it, it would be such a wonderful place. But what does she say in verse 5? Look with me again in verse 5. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatsoever Jesus says unto you, do it. Can you tell anybody anything better than what Mary has told the servants? I can't tell. I could come up here and I could just preach a sermon on that. I would, may not last very long. Of course, you guys would like it because we'd be here like five minutes, okay? But I could come up every, every Sunday morning and say, whatsoever Jesus saith to do, do it, and it's complete. That's a complete sermon. It's up to you to go through and dig through the Bible and see what Jesus says. But it is complete enough that it can bring you to salvation. What does it mean? It means that Jesus said to repent. Jesus said to confess him as Savior. Jesus said to turn your back on sin. Jesus said to be baptized. Jesus said that once you was baptized, you'd receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of those sins. And Jesus said for us to be faithful until death. So whatever Jesus says to do, do it. And that's what Mary told these, these servants. Could you imagine? He wants us to do what? Just do it. But it's water. Do it. And how many times... Do we try to interject that in there as well? Jesus said to do it, but, but what? Do it. I mean, what, what did we just celebrate? The birth of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Why would we celebrate it if we weren't going to do what he said to do? Come Easter time, we're going to celebrate the fact that he went to the cross and died for our sins. If we weren't going to do what Jesus said to do, why would we celebrate what he did for us on the cross? But that's what Mary gave us the example. That was her response. That was the culmination of 30 some odd years of being with Jesus. And how about us that's a little older in our faith? How about some of you folks that are a little more rooted in your faith and you have a young person come up to you that maybe don't understand and don't understand what they should do and how they should react. Isn't that great advice for us to give a young Christian or a young person? Whatever Jesus says to do, just do it. You'll be fine. Follow what Jesus says, and it'll all work out just fine. So I'm not sure that she doesn't give us the best advice in the scriptures. Not discounting the other encouragements and stuff from all of the other writers, but if we in this world would just simply do what Jesus said to do, we would have heaven on earth. Because that's what we see. We see the result of people rejecting what Jesus said to do versus the result of what people that do what Jesus said to do. That's what separates us all. And it's Jesus. It's that little baby that we celebrated yesterday. That little birth in that lowly manger. And we all, we know the surroundings. But it's the response of his mother, the one who was probably closest to him, as we know how moms are, closest to Jesus than anyone else, the one that would know and understand better than any of us or any who have ever come after, that just following what Jesus says to do is the most important thing that we can do in our lives. So I think Mary gives us a great example. The four times that she speaks in the scriptures leaves us with a great deal of knowledge about her and really us. If God leads you to do something regardless of how unlikely it seems, trust him. Have faith in God. Share with others and confirm your blessings of your service to him. And realize that you're going to make a misstep but don't let it destroy you. Repoint, repent and move forward regardless, regardless of the repercussions here on earth. 
Never fail to repent because you think that you will suffer something here greater than separation from God. And then finally, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Just simply do it. Pretty simple stuff, really. It's actually an easy sermon to write once I got my mind set to study and read and understand. And as we just celebrated the birth of Jesus, as I said yesterday, now it comes time for your response. We know what everyone's response was yesterday to the Christmas. We know that we gathered around trees and we opened gifts uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We gathered with family and had wonderful meals and, and great times of fellowship. Today, the day after Christmas, it's required that you respond to Jesus now. You acknowledged him yesterday. We acknowledged his birth. It demands a response. Will you do as Jesus said to do? Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. Up until this moment in time right now, you have rejected him. That was your response, is the rejection. And we see rejection all throughout the scriptures of people that rejected to do what Jesus said to do. But wonderfully, we also see people that accepted and did what Jesus said to do. Who are you going to be today? Now maybe, maybe you have had a Passover moment and life has caught up with you and life has caused you to, to forget whose you are and, and uh, Jesus, you've got us worried to death. Maybe you just need that small, still voice to say, I'm about my father's business. I still love you. I still care for you. It's going to be okay. Won't you come back into the relationship that we once had? And I want to encourage you to do that today as well. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation softly and tenderly, uh, verses three or two and three, rather. And if you have a decision to make, I want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing.